would like to introduce uh, Mr. Paul Stott. Uh, Paul is a lecturer at uh, the University of Leicester and the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS uh, at the University of London. Uh, he is an EFSAS research fellow and he received his PhD a couple of years ago, 2015, um, at the University of East Anglia for research on British jihadism, the detail and the denial. Paul, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good to, uh, to see so many people in the room and uh, also, of course, to notice some of the similarities between British and Dutch academia. Um, at SOAS we talk about SOAS time, which means that everything starts five or ten minutes later than advertised and uh, we've been fashionably late here as well. So uh, I've always said when I write my memoirs of my time as a British academic I'm going to call the book Let's Just Give It Another Five Minutes, Shall We? And, uh, so, um, more seriously, thank you everyone for uh, the invitation and to uh, the faculty and to FSAS for the organisational work. Now, I start with an image that uh, perhaps the lighting isn't 100% uh, clear, but uh, this is a picture taken in London of the group that's usually referred to as Al Maharoon, which translates as the Exiles. And this is a banned group under counter-terrorism legislation in the UK and a group that has, has basically renamed and reformed itself continuously over more than a decade, taking a series of different names. So you'll sometimes find uh, the same people in uh, Muslims for, Against Crusades, same people in the Sharia Project, same people in Islam for UK, etc, etc. And this particular uh, image is on a day, I think it's 2011 or 2012, when they launched a group called Sharia for Pakistan. So, today, going to focus on, on one particular type of uh, terrorism, jihadist uh, violence, and at times probably be a bit more of a focus on the UK, perhaps, than continental Europe. Although I will go on to talk about how the links between Britons and individuals and groups in, uh, e in other uh, EU countries have become increasingly important. And also a theme... Uh, running through the talk will really be about the importance of Pakistan and that interaction between Britain and Pakistan. So I think there's definitely uh, some differences in the security challenges that European countries uh, face, but also a lot of similarities. Now it's always a challenge in any talk on terrorism to know where to start. And I mean you can tell a lot about uh, a speaker's uh, focus, where they're coming from, by their starting point. And I just wanted to go back to 1981, because in the West we haven't always been negative about Islamist actors. We haven't always been negative about armed Islamist actors. And my image here shows our then uh, Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and she's meeting with General Zia, who at the time was Pakistan's military dictator. And General Zia, certainly a man who knew how to treat a lady, he took Mrs. Thatcher to Peshawar to visit a refugee camp. And there she was able to meet um, refugees from the um, conflict uh, in Afghanistan, then uh, against the uh, Soviet-backed government, but also to meet some of the Afghan Mujahideen. So this was very much an endorsement from the UK, firstly of Zia, who seized power in a military coup and executed uh, the previous uh, leader, uh, Zulfikar Bhutto, but it was also an endorsement of that armed struggle against communism. So there's a, a particular backdrop, and uh, one that I do think we need to, to recognise and engage with. Uh, Mark Curtis, in his book on uh, the relationship between Britain and radical Islam, finds very much that, uh, contrary to what you might expect, the UK has, has usually been able to find some, foreign, uh, some common ground with uh, religious actors, probably much more so than those on the radical left or nationalist actors in the Middle East and South Asia. Now, the 1990s is probably the, uh, the decade where we first see a cross-fertilisation of uh, ideas and actions between uh, groups 
and uh, clerics in South Asia and Europe. And a particular starting point really is the Bosnian uh, Civil War, where uh, I think it's Evan Coleman said in his book, this really brings together uh, young idealistic Western Muslims with Arab fighters uh, looking for their next struggle after uh, their uh, victory uh, as they saw it in Afghanistan and also fighters from the Indian subcontinent. And certainly for a lot of, of young Britons who uh, are radicalised in this era, the, the Bosnian conflict is, is particularly uh, important. And when that comes to an end, people are seen uh, moving on to Kashmir, and then later in the decade, on to Afghanistan. But it's not simply about armed groups, uh, necessarily. Um, if we look at uh, 1993, we see the first of a series of, of speaking tours of uh, controversial uh, Pakistani clerics in the UK. So you have uh, Masood Azhar coming uh, to speak to the Diabandis, uh, a particularly uh, conservative strain um, of Islam, who um, I think govern more mosques than any other uh, stripe of Islam uh, in Britain. And by 1994, it's really clear to the authorities that some things are happening. And we have the involvement of uh, Omar Saeed Sheikh, a, a former uh, British student at the London School of Economics, in kidnappings in India. And if you look at my, my further example there of the, the speaking tour of uh, members of the Lashkar Taiba uh, group, which included speaking at Leicester University where I do some of my teaching. And I don't really think the authorities had much of a handle on, on who these guys were. But we now know, for example, in the, the speeches at the university, they were calling on people to go to Bosnia, to go to Kashmir to fight. And that particular group, Lashka uh, Taiba, uh, ends up being responsible for the Mumbai attacks in 2008. Just excuse me one moment, I'm wrestling with a cold at the moment. How did young Britons come into the jihadist organisations in this period? Well, this is an email from a press expose in 1999, which concerned a, a rail industry professional a uh, man working for, for rail track called Mohammed Sahal, who was really the sort of the go-to point for Britons wanting to train in Pakistan-occupied uh, Kashmir, uh, uh, Muzaffarabad, uh, forget my tongue around it there. And he's recruiting, as you can see, to camps run by the LET group. Advanced training for three months for students is a sort of shorter version just uh, 15 days, and he can also arrange for you to go to Afghanistan. Obviously, the 9-11 attacks in 2001 really concentrate minds and concentrate focus on what has been happening in the previous decade. And really, by uh, late 2001, the two or three months after 9-11, Security agencies, police forces uh, across Europe are well aware that there are connections in a whole series of, of uh, European countries to events uh, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, two days before 9-11, uh, an Afghan leader who was opposed to the Taliban, uh, Ahmed Shah uh, Massoud, was assassinated. And uh, in a way, this is a, a stroke of strategic genius by uh, Al-Qaeda because they were anticipating the 9-11 attacks would go ahead, that they would be successful, and that they may well draw the United States into an invasion. So they wanted to take out the person who was the likely leader of uh, anti-Taliban forces in Afghanistan. And they'd sent over... Um, group of people who I think uh, actually were Tunisians but who'd entered the country on Belgian passports. And Massoud, for a variety of reasons, delayed the interviews, uh, delayed the interview over a period of days, and they became more and more agitated. Which of course was a clue, they realised they had to get it, get it done uh, before 9-11. Massoud eventually granted the interview two days before and was killed uh, by explosives hidden in the camera equipment. 
and uh, as well as having uh, Belgian passports, these in individuals had a recommendation uh, letter from uh, an Islamic cleric in the UK. So the European security uh, services uh, are beginning to see that there's a whole range of associates uh, across Europe. Abdullah Razam, uh, one of the, the heroes of the um, Afghan war, usually seen as the sort of spiritual uh, founder of uh, Al-Qaeda. And in 2001, his book, uh, The Lofty Mountain, appears uh, in English uh, translation with an afterword from a Spanish convert to Islam who'd been killed in the uh, retreat from Tora Bora that uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban uh, fought. And again, uh, a UK publisher, uh, Spanish uh, writer of the afterword. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, film Sliding Doors, starring uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Ah, a hand, excellent, great film. But um, it, in that, basically, two different stories play out uh, at, at the same time, where story one, Gwyneth Paltrow gets onto a tube train, and her life continues. Story two, she misses the train by, by seconds, has to go home, finds her boyfriend with somebody else, and then you know, meets the, the man of her dreams. Sort of, you know, typical British romantic uh, comedy. But the international jihad has its own sliding doors moment. My extract here is from the 9-11 Commission. Uh, my extract here from the 9-11 Commission report. And uh, the organisers of 9-11, uh, many have been living in Hamburg uh, in the years prior to the attacks where Mohammed Atta was a, was a PhD student. And according to the, the Commission report, they'd all agreed that they would finish their time in Germany and go to Chechnya to fight the Russians. And by chance, they met a fellow Arab on the train who said, no, don't go to Chechnya, go to Afghanistan. So they went to Afghanistan, were selected by Al-Qaeda for the 9-11 attacks, and the rest is history. So on just such, such small details, so much potentially can change. So, 9-11, as I was saying, puts these uh, events across the 1990s into some perspective. And we begin to get, uh, across Europe, a critical examination. Some of those have been travelling to the Indian subcontinent, some of those going to Afghanistan. And this is particularly heightened as arrests start to occur, of people uh, flushed out, if you like, by uh, the American bombing campaign in Afghanistan, flushed out by the Americans' tactics of uh, paying large sums of money, bounties for the, for the arrests of uh, foreign fighters. Usually, though, the development of jihadist actors, certainly in the UK, is traced to particular Arab exiles. You have a large group of, of Saudis who settle in the UK in the 1990s who release uh, many of uh, bin Laden's uh, statements by fax, um, in the 1990s from Britain. But you also have individuals like Abu Hamza, Abu Qatada, and Omar Bakri Mohammed, who founded the Al Maharoon group, uh, who I pictured earlier, who uh, come from different uh, parts of the uh, Arab diaspora. In France, the focus is often on Franco Algerians. Again, many of those Franco Algerians, under pressure from the French police and security services, move to London. Belgium and Holland. Uh, issues potentially sometimes around uh, those of Moroccan uh, heritage who've popped up in, uh, in different uh, armed groups. But more recently we've seen an interesting shift where um, there's been a, a discovery, if you like, of how central South Asia appears to have been. And the British writer uh, Dave Rich, uh, looking at um, uh, much broader issues, but uh, rights of the jihad in Kashmir, that this really... Um, was the, the precedent for what we've seen of, of Britons going to Syria. This sort of ideological, uh, this search for actually existing Sharia. This search for struggle abroad. And uh, you know, it has a, a profound effect on British uh, Muslim uh, politics. In his Bowen, who's the BBC's religious affairs uh, correspondent, stresses the importance of these Pakistani clerics coming to, to Deobandi mosques. 
I won't go into an enormous amount of detail about some of the individuals uh, here, as they probably won't be uh, familiar to uh, students. But really, we can go back as far as 1996 for the first suicide bombing by, uh, by Britain. And uh, examples here on the screen of a series of actions in either Afghanistan, India, or Pakistan involving uh, Britons. Omar Saeed Sheikh, who's in the uh, picture, is uh, arrested by the Indians and is eventually freed uh, alongside uh, Masood uh, Azhar after an Indian Airways uh, flight is hijacked and taken to Afghanistan. And the Indians really uh, have no option other than to, uh, to cut a deal. He goes on to be responsible for the killing of Daniel Pearl, an American uh, journalist investigating connections between Pakistan and the 9-11 attacks. And so that's why you'll sometimes find online uh, accusations linking him to Pakistani uh, intelligence. Now Dorothy's going to be on some of those, some of that territory uh, a little later. I have to say, usually Britain's popping up in these groups, um, you know, they're not in senior roles, they're foot soldiers. Uh, Omar Saeed Sheikh, probably uh, one of the rare examples uh, to the country, and also uh, Rashid Ralph from Birmingham, a Britain who marries into uh, the, the um, Army of Mohammed group, uh, the JEM, uh, marries uh, the daughter of one of the group's uh, leaders, and was killed in an American drone attack, I think in, uh, in 2008, having very mysteriously escaped from Pakistani custody. His guards took him to McDonald's and then left him on their own whilst they went to pray. Okay, some of the terrorist attacks in the UK linked to Pakistan and the period or terrorist plots in the period from 2000 uh, to 2008. And you'll see on there, for example, the 7-7 bombings, the attacks on the London uh, tube system and uh, buses that killed 52 civilians. And it's worth stressing that the two participants in uh, that attack who um, made suicide videos had both been in Pakistan in the months before the attacks. Mohammed Sadiqi Khan, the organiser uh, of the attacks, right up until I think 72 hours before, was making frequent phone calls to uh, public call boxes in Pakistan. So almost certainly for, uh, for advice. And this led to a um, meeting between the British and Pakistani Prime Ministers in 2008, and uh, it's alleged on the British side there, three quarters of the terror plots in the UK originated from Pakistan. In the literature, you may well see uh, a term used, Londonistan. And what I found in my PhD, my book uh, as well, which will hopefully come out next year, is I'm able to name 14 different countries from which um, armed fighters have settled in the UK. And this really plays out um, frequently uh, in terms of pressure on the British government from foreign governments who are concerned about their own security due to these, uh, these actors, these guys in exile, if you like, are, are, are still supporting the cause. The massacre of tourists in Egypt in 1997, for example, um, the Egyptian government blames it on uh, Egyptian fighters based in Afghanistan and Britain. Now, I interviewed uh, Charles Clark, whose name is <coughs> mentioned there, who was both Home Secretary and, and Police Minister uh, in the UK, and a lot of pressure was put on Britain in this period by foreign governments. And you can see there are a mixture there of uh, North African governments and EU countries. So, the UK certainly had or has uh, an issue. Now, interestingly, things do seem to to settle down, and there's a much, much quieter period, certainly until the rise of um, Islamic State. What we've seen in more recent years is examples of European Muslims living in the UK, or who've converted to Islam in Britain, who then pop up in Iraq and Syria. Harry Sarfo from Germany, a black convert, one example, also a big group of Portuguese speakers 
in London who leave to join Islamic State. My picture here is uh, Mohammed Abrini, here I think still awaiting trial for involvement in the Paris and Brussels attacks. But some of the funding for that came from him uh, travelling from Syria to Birmingham to collect money that was raised uh, by uh, Moroccans based in the UK uh, from benefit fraud. And whilst here, he uh, busied himself doing the stadium tour at Manchester United's ground. When he was arrested by the Belgian police, various pictures on the ground are on, the phone, on his phone. Okay, last two slides. Um, how does this play out in terms of organisational uh, links? Well, the Al Mahroom group, in the period when it's known as Islam for UK, spawns a, a Belgian sister group, Sharia for, for Belgium. You can see uh, the two uh, respective uh, leaders there, uh, Fawad uh, Belkassar in Belgium, uh, Anton Chowdhury um, in the UK. And these groups are using very similar rhetoric, looking to establish Sharia, not in the Middle East or the Indian subcontinent necessarily, but here in London, in Brussels, uh, in Europe uh, as well. And very provocative approach to the media. On the day uh, Islam for UK was banned under counter-terrorism legislation, Anjum Chowdhury was interviewed by the BBC. You know, so we, we did give a platform um, to these uh, actors. And um, certainly uh, the numbers who've gone out to Syria to fight are in the dozens. But as late as 2015, uh, an al Mahroon member uh, from London, Dr. Mirza Ali, flees uh, criminal charges in the UK, goes back to Pakistan, and is killed fighting for the Taliban. So the South Asian connections never, never quite end. So, just some final points. We seem to be in a bit of a lull now in terms of jihadist violence in Europe. 2015, 2016, 2017, considerably worse years than we've seen this year. And rather remind me of the period 2011, 2012 um, uh, in the UK. Now, if you look at the, the Dutch intelligence agency's uh, report uh, earlier this year, it was a, a link to um, that. They do, though, see that um, global jihad uh, is the new normal. You know, these groups who are, who are able to, to move across borders or to spread their propaganda and ideas uh, almost at will. I want to finish really with a couple of points and to stress that um, South Asia has historically been so important. And we don't know where uh, those who survived the conflict in Syria and Iraq may go to next. Certainly with some of the British Pakistanis They've been stripped of their British passports whilst fighting in Syria, and so they may have few options other than to go back uh, to Pakistan. So, um, happy to discuss these issues more uh, in the Q&A. You can see my email address on there in terms of, of getting the slides and, and discussing these issues further as well. So, thank you for listening.